it's wonderful to uh, welcome you all online to the uh, annual Doctorate in Clinical Psychology Research Conference at the University of Liverpool. My name's Ross White, I'm the research director on the program, and uh, it's my honor to introduce uh, our keynote speaker today. And we're delighted to have Dr. Chris Graham with us uh, from Queen's University, Belfast. If I can now turn just to introduce Dr. Chris Graham. Chris is a clinical psychologist. He's also a senior lecturer at uh, Queen's University Belfast, where he's the academic director on the uh, Doctorate in Clinical Psychology program. So Chris and I um, live or come from towns very close to each other in Northern Ireland. And we also trained as clinical psychologists in Scotland, myself at the University of Glasgow and Chris at the uh, University of Edinburgh. We were sharing the wealth. <laughs> Splitting, splitting the wealth across central belt of Scotland. And um, yeah. we also go to the same hairdresser. <laughs> yeah, and it doesn't cost us too much either. <laughs> so um, Chris also shares an interest in third wave psychological interventions, um, acceptance and commitment therapy. And uh, we are both trainers in acceptance and commitment therapy, and it's been great to get to know Chris more and more through the Association of Contextual Behavioral Science, and um, that organizes the annual conferences for ACT, but also is a, a great hub for the community of people interested in acceptance and commitment therapy. So Chris specifically does clinical trials of ACT for improving uh, quality of life in health conditions, chronic health conditions, but also has an interest in evaluating interventions aimed at reducing clinician burnout and also reducing self-harm. Um, it's important also to emphasize that uh, Chris is still clinically active and his work focuses mainly on neurological conditions. And the title of his presentation today is Acceptance and Commitment Therapy for Improving Wellbeing in Chronic Diseases. And we're just so grateful, Chris, that you agreed to contribute. And initially you were um, going to enjoy a visit over to Liverpool, but uh, we're grateful that you've um, remained true to that commitment that you've made and that you're able to present today and be with us uh, for the, the conference online. There is an opportunity towards the end of Chris's time for uh, questions. And we would encourage people to use the chat box uh, to write questions down that might arise um, going through. In addition, there'll be an opportunity if we have some time left at the end for people to raise a hand so that we can um, take uh, questions from the floor. So just bear with us as we're scrolling across five pages of different photographs and names. We will try to get to you. Um, Chris, I'll Without much much ado, I'll, I'll step back now and I'll allow you to take the floor. You have the opportunity to share your screen. I, I think you've got some yeah, slides. Yeah, let me see if that, if that works. Um, has that worked? Yes, we're seeing that. Yes. Okay. Um, okay. Um, all right, so hello to all you Liverpoolians um, and adopted Liverpoolians from your cousins in Belfast. Um, what I'm going to do is I'm going to talk about um, research that has really become my passion and my privilege over the last 11 years. Um, since really I started as an assistant psychologist on a neurology ward with my copy of an introduction to CBT tucked under my um, arm, I've been interested in understanding how people adjust to living with long term conditions. And by long-term condition, I mean things like multiple sclerosis or stroke or diabetes or HIV or cancer. Um, physical health conditions that you need to live with um, and manage and often in the long term. Um, in particular, I've been interested in why some people within this difficult context seem to cope so well while others struggle um, and find it difficult. Um, I've also been interested in why illnesses look different from the outside. So to us clinicians, we, we can sometimes have a mismatch between how we understand people should cope with conditions and how they actually do. 
Um, and crucially, uh, since training as a clinical psychologist, I've been particularly interested in what we as clinical psychologists can do, help people adjust to their conditions. So that's what I'm going to talk about um, today. So I'm just going to begin uh, by talking about psychological therapies for long-term conditions, where and how they might apply. Then I'm going to go on to talk about ACT. And then I'm going to talk about evidence for ACT. And then coming from the evidence and what it looks like at the minute, there's a few unanswered questions. And I'm going to look at these in turn. Within this, I'm going to talk about uh, some of my own research. I'm going to take that opportunity. Um, okay, so why psychological therapies for long-term conditions? So long-term conditions create a challenging context. Obviously, within many conditions, there are symptoms, and these can often cause functional impairments, so uh, limbs that don't work as they should, um, other symptoms as well that affect how the body works. Then you can also get things like pain and fatigue. And not only do you have these symptoms, but you also have the necessity then to manage them, which often involves taking medication, going to the hospital, going for physio, and various other things that might disrupt your life and how you want to live your life. So it all has an impact on some of the really important stuff in life, which is how we function within our relationships and how we function within our families, potentially. It can also impact on work. People might need to adapt how they work or the environments in which they work. Unsurprisingly, again, all this can have an emotional impact. Um, so people can be worried about the future if their condition progresses. They can feel low in mood, life has changed to a certain extent. Um, and they can feel um, lots of fear as well. Now, the stuff that really into me as a clinical psychologist and has increasingly interested me over the years is how long-term conditions can affect identity. So sometimes it can make stories about, about being unwell or being a patient or being changed very available to people. So I'm interested in that. And I'm also interested in how illness can impact on self-to-self -self relationships as well. Um, in particular, I wonder about some conditions that can come with um, perceived mistakes. So things that you've done, you know, things like potentially a mistake that has led to head injury or behaviors that have led to cancer, et cetera, et cetera. I'm interested in how that enters into the self-to-self -self relationships between a future self, a past self, and a present self, and how that can make that complex. Now I've focused on the negative here, but the thing I mentioned at the very start is that chronic diseases, long-term conditions can look different from the inside than they do uh, from the outside looking in. And what we often see, and there's a few studies that demonstrate this, is that healthcare professionals and caregivers rate the quality of life of people with chronic conditions. So if I'm thinking about chronic conditions that, that, that come with quite um, extreme, um, uh, symptom sort of load. Um, so things like Duchenne muscular dystrophy or motor neuron disease. People from the outside can rate quality of life much lower than the person who has the condition. So actually quality of life for many people is retained. And the question that sort of I, I, I maybe my research journey began with was back in my PhD. Um, when I really started to see that people with muscular dystrophies that were quite progressed, many of them had really good quality of life. And that surprised me at the time. But why is this? There's one theory that suggests that it's to do with um, a response shift. I don't know if people are aware of a response shift. I can't, I'm not in the room, so I can't see people's nodding or, or, or shaking heads at this stage. But uh, the response shift, part of it is about quality of life. And the idea is that um, when somebody goes through a... Well, the idea is the quality of life is how your experience meets your expectations. And your quality of life is the gap between the two. So if expectation is not met by experience, then you have a lower quality of life. If it's met, then you have a higher quality of life. And there's been quite a pessimistic readings in the past, and that is that people with long-term conditions maintain good quality of life because they reduce their expectations in life. Um, and therefore their experience, although less so, um, remain gap between the two, remains similar, so quality of life is high. Now, working as a clinical psychologist, 
this people with neurological conditions like motor neuron disease or a progressed MS. This is not what I've seen. And um, what I've seen is people re reorientating towards what's important in life. And particularly that often involves um, reorientating to who's important in life and what relationships are important. So people often um, leave behind some of that stuff that's less important in the face of a long-term condition and, and a difficult diagnosis. So this is really, this is partly where I got interested in ACT. And this is the idea of values in ACT, knowing what's personally important to you clearly and consciously and then doing things that support that consciously. So given the challenges and the opportunities within chronic illness, it's unsurprising okay, that alongside the biological and social factors that psychological variables correlate with well-being and quality of life. And we can see across studies, and there's many studies in this, many hundreds of studies, and we can see that things like how somebody copes with their condition and regulates the emotions, the beliefs they have about it, and the beliefs they have about the medication or the treatment for it, alongside how confident they feel the ability to manage challenges. And then crucially, psychological flexibility, which I'll come to in a second. Crucially for me, I should say. And many of these variables correlate with quality of life. So there's a range of different therapies that have been trialed for improving the variables I've just mentioned to improve well-being in long-term conditions. So there's a good evidence base for CBT, particularly with cancer. Mindfulness, there's a growing evidence base, although it's newer as an intervention in this area. Psychodynamic uh, treatments also have a place in caring for people with long-term conditions. If you think about it, people are entering into a cared for and a caregiver role often. Um, and that can introduce some interesting relational dynamics. And then finally, here's the seminal systematic review um, that suggests that ACT maybe has a role here as well. So what is ACT? Well, ACT is a newer type of cognitive behavioural therapy, it's sometimes called contextual CBT, and it aims specifically to engender a quality called psychological flexibility. To improve psychological flexibility, there's a number of different methods you can use in ACT. Um, the most frequently used ones are, um, I, I should say that, that ACT is a little bit of a magpie as an intervention. As long as you're improving psychological flexibility, you can use a number of different methods. But the main methods that we use are aspects of mindfulness, things taken from behavior therapy like functional analysis, and then also perspective taking exercises too. But what's important to say is that, like I suppose like many other psychological therapies, maybe every psychological therapy, the main thing we use to improve psychological flexibility is conversation, the conversation we have with the person in the room with us, or a self-help book that we've written. Um, and also the therapeutic relationship, the interpersonal dynamics that happen within a room, the transference and counter-transference that we work with. The other thing to say about ACT is that it sort of sits outside of diagnostic categories and it's applicable to the general problem of human suffering. It's about helping everybody live well with different thoughts and feelings that are a natural part of life, a natural part of trying to do the stuff that we care about. Um, Okay. Okay, so what is psychological flexibility, you may ask. Um, so, um, psychological flexibility is a compound, quite a, a broad variable that you can divide up in lots of different ways. So, psychological flexibility would suggest that to be effective and grow, you first need to be aware of what matters to you. Okay, and consistently act in line with the things that matter to you, with your values. Now, this sounds very straightforward, but um, if you think about a recent meaningful thing that you did, a thing that was in line with your values, it could be your interview for the clinical course. I know a lot of you are new onto the clinical course in Liverpool, so maybe that's one to think about. Um, it could be when you walk down the aisle, it could be another job interview, it could be before you joined the gym, any of these things. Within all the, the really lovely emotions that may have been there, anticipation, 
the excitement, the joy, the pleasant surprise. There might have also been within that some difficult emotions, some anxiety, some fear, some embarrassment, some uncertainty. So in order to do what matters to you, it's often the case that we also need to be open to some of the difficult experiences that might come our way. So it's a bit like a ticket. So on one side, you've got the show you really want to see, the thing that you care about, and um, the thing that's really important to you. And then on the other side of the ticket, you've got the cost, and that's the difficult thoughts and feelings that come along with it. And what we can often see, um, and it's, I suppose this is true of, of me as, as anybody else, but, but what we can often see is that people sometimes throw the ticket away in order to not have the difficult thoughts and feelings. So to be able to grow, we would say that we also need to be able to open up to difficult thoughts and feelings. The thoughts part is interesting as well. If you make contact with that experience, that important experience to you, there might have been like really pleasant and helpful thoughts within that about how exciting this is and how lovely this is, how well this is all going. But also there too, there may have been a narrative about how you're making a fool of yourself or you're gonna fail um, or any number of thoughts. And psychological flexibility involves being able to step back from thoughts and see them as thoughts. Because if you get hooked into those thoughts, you can sometimes be taken away from the present moment and into a really feared for future or a really bleak past and not in the present with all the possibilities that that, that offers you. Also, as part of psychological flexibility, you want to be able to take different perspectives on your own story and on your own life. And this process really interests me the most within psychological flexibility. It's called self as context. But it's about being able to step back from those deeply held stories about who you are, who you aren't, who you'll always be and will never be. Sometimes when we get bought into those stories, it can really keep our behavior fixed in a narrow range and we get scared to step outside of it. So you need to be able to step back and be flexible about those stories. So you can see that psychological flexibility is the integration of all these different sub-processes. Here's a formal definition. This is my favorite definition. Everybody's got one. I'm sure Ross has his. Um, so this is by uh, Lance McCracken and Stephen Morley. And so psychological flexibility is the capacity to persist or to change behavior in a way that includes conscious and open contact with thoughts and feelings. That's about being open appreciates what the situation affords, that's about being present, and then serves one's goals and values, that's about doing what matters. Okay. So there's the flexibility bit of psychological flexibility <laughs> is maybe more straightforward. So effective functioning within a difficult context and long-term conditions are, they do offer up, as I said at the start, some very available narratives about who you are and what your future holds. They do naturally bring difficult thoughts and feelings, of course they do. Um, but it requires flexibility. So think about it. Learning to regulate and control unpleasant feelings like anxiety or low mood or embarrassment, that's often really helpful. But if you rigidly apply it, then it might prevent you from doing important things. If you need to get rid of anxiety to go there and do that, you might not go there and do that. Trying always to be positive, that's generally probably quite helpful. But if you do it all the time, then you might miss opportunities to learn and grow from unwanted outcomes. You might not be sensitive to context. Problem solving, again, generally helpful. Thinking about the problem ahead, trying to break it down into parts and trying to find a solution. But if you think about it, what is worrying if not that? Thinking about the future, trying to solve the problem, trying to find the answer. So rigidly applying it can end up unhelpful. All right, so psychological flexibility is the goal of ACT. And there's a few things I want you to notice because I think it's important um, in understanding why ACT might apply in long-term conditions. It's not about feeling less bad, ACT. It's not about feeling only good or better. It's not about thinking positively. It's not about thinking realistically. And within that, it's not about cat not catastrophizing either. And it's not about necessarily doing what is right or good by, my, by somebody else's or society's standards. So the benefits here for long-term conditions are that 
the face of a difficult diagnosis, if you get in, you might have experienced this yourself um, at some point, perhaps, um, or you might have worked with others who have or have family members who have, but it's really natural to feel upset. That's a natural part of the human experience. It's also natural to have difficult thoughts and feelings and fears about the future. Of course you would, that's what your mind does. So focusing on trying to alter somebody's emotions and somebody's natural response and somebody's negative and in inverted commas cognitions might be tricky to do. As a therapist, it might risk undermining a natural human response. And also there might be less room to change cognitions if the context really dull, poor, difficult ones. What if it really is that bad? On the other hand as well, the, the other thing is from working with people who um, are in conditions that come with, with a shortened lifespan and come with a really high symptom load, is that even within this, and this has been a real personal lesson for me, it's still possible to do some or all, or even sometimes even more of the things that are important to you within that challenging context. And because that's this, it's still possible to live quite well, even with the most severe, severe long-term conditions. And that's what we see. And ACT is focused on that primarily. It's about finding ways to live well within a context where difficult thoughts and feelings are very present to you. Okay, so what does ACT involve? I'm not gonna go into this in too much detail. You're gonna get fantastic teaching, obviously on the Liverpool course about this. So. Um, I don't want to step on any toes here. Um, but anyway, what does ACT involve? So if you think about the process of any ACT or any psychological therapy, it sort of looks a bit like this. So it's assessment to begin with, where you ask lots of questions and you try and understand the person and empathize with them. Then you use that to build a formulation, which is about, um, it's a working model of what's happening for the person, what's supporting the problem, why it's happening now and what might be change and modify. Then you've got treatment, which is considering this explanation for the person's difficulty, what can we change? What can we help them experiment with making changes to, to improve outcomes? And it's a cyclical process. Um, you go back to assessment and formula, reassess, you reformulate, and you hopefully get more and more helpful as time goes on through this process. What's less spoken about I think, um, in clinical psychology in general, and I think it's a wee shame because it's quite interesting, is that Almost every psychological, well, actually probably every psychological therapy that we use or learn, a stance or an ethos or an underlying philosophy. Um, an act has a particular philosophy that under called functional contextualism. And also it comes from a behavioral account of language within cognition called relational frame theory. I'm gonna go into neither in too much detail, um, but one thing I just like to notice is that um, functional contextualism is concerned, instead of trying to work out what is true, you're trying to work out what helps someone. It's very pragmatic. And the stance as well that's within ACT is about being equal with the person you're working with. As I said earlier, when I was describing psychological flexibility, the processes in that are relevant to us all. It's about how all of us cope with difficult thoughts and feelings. So the people we're working with, we see, as not, as yes in a different context, yes with a different history, but no, um, not really struggling, struggling in pathological ways, more in very human and very common ways. Okay, so moving on to assessment, how do you assess in ACT? Well, you're looking out for behaviours or narratives that might indicate that somebody is struggling with different aspects of psychological flexibility. So are they really struggling to talk about or to communicate what's important to them? Do they know what's important to them but just struggle to do it because it comes along with difficult thoughts and feelings? Do they struggle to be in the moment and are worrying or ruminating a lot of time? Do they come with really deep-seated, heavy stories about themselves, their world, and, and what's possible for them? And crucially, although this is all present in the moment, present in the session, within ACT, we might want to see where these behaviours started, where they emerged. What is it about somebody's learning history that means the, these ways of relating to themselves and the world are present now? And often that can be quite powerful. And for those of you that um, are more aware of ACT, you might know the passengers on the bus metaphor. 
which is it's a way of understanding the difficult thoughts and feelings that people have and then enabling them to see the choices they have around interacting with them differently. What I'll often ask uh, people I'm working with is, where did that passenger get onto your bus? If we're talking about the thoughts they have and we can look back in their history and see where they've learned this thing about themselves or the world. All right, so formulation in ACT, what does that look like? Well, in ACT, you're trying to train or reinforce general dynamic skills for noticing and making choices that work. So we help people notice, we encourage them to notice what they do, to be more sensitive to context, and we help them to think about their choices within the frame of their values. If you were to do that, would that be a step towards or away from what's important to you? We also use metaphors, and metaphors are really useful because what they can do is they can help somebody notice the choices that they have in a given situation. So if you think about the uh, passengers on the bus metaphor, for those of you that are aware, what that helps somebody see is the new options that they have around interacting with the difficult thoughts and feelings that they have. So it opens up choices and options and gives people a framework for understanding their behavior. Moving on very briefly to treatment, I'm just gonna give an example of one uh, of psychological flexibility and how we work on that before I move on to the research. So if you're trying to enhance um, experiential acceptance, then you would do that within the conversation for the most part. Um, and you might say things like, when you worry, does it keep the bad feelings away? Does it keep them away for good? And is there a call? Does this pain, this emotional pain and discomfort that you have tell you anything about what you really care about? And what if you were willing to have that feeling? What if you were willing to have the embarrassment that comes with being out in the street with your stick or in your wheelchair? Would that enable you to do things differently? And we might help them see that difficult thoughts and feelings can be a part of doing what's important. To do things important, to care, to love, there's always the possibility for loss. And so we might help them see that those two things come together within a metaphor like the ticket metaphor or passengers on the bus. And then exercises, workability exercises and the choice point we might use. I'm not gonna explain those in detail, but you can, you can look them up and, and, and find them. Okay, so that's ACT. So at the end of my, my clinical psychology training, I got really interested in the evidence base for ACT and long-term conditions. To me, the model seemed to really fit with the people I was seeing clinic and really with understanding uh, theoretically a way to help support people who are in objectively difficult contexts. Um, but I just wondered what was out there. So what happens if you look in the literature is that there's a lot of enthusiasm for ACT as an intervention for improving outcomes in long-term conditions. And there's lots of articles that look a bit like this. Okay, so these are articles that sort of theoretically set up ACT as an intervention that would be appropriate for a given condition. So, so here we have diabetes management. This is, this is proposing that, that ACT might have a role there. Here we have um, by ACT for acquired brain injury, proposing how ACT might have been there. Here's one for cancer. And then I also did one of these as well. So here's, here's one of ACT for um, muscular dystrophies and, and muscle disorders. Now, what's even more interesting um, and enthusiasm for ACT among clinical academics is that clinically, if you look across clinical health services in the UK and beyond, ACT is really commonly used and there's one study from 2014 by Thuis, uh, 2014, so six years ago, that showed that techniques from ACT are the most commonly applied interventions for fear of recurrence in cancer. So that's one of the biggest uh, clinical um, referral, um, referrals we might see in one of the bit, biggest clinical populations who might be referred to us. And ACT back then, six years ago, was one of the most commonly used methods. So this really got me thinking, what is the evidence base? So, at the end, as I say, of my clinical training, um, I did a systematic review to look at this. Um, and you can see a co-author here is your own very lovely Charlotte Crahe, um, and also very, very good um, collaborators and supervisors from Edinburgh as well. 
Um, so what we did in this study is we tried to get together every clinical study that looked at an ACT intervention in long-term conditions. So case studies, pre-post designs, randomized control trials. Um, and the results were really, I suppose, quite stark. Because what we found is that there were only eight randomized control trials. And those eight trials um, were largely of really low quality, which actually precluded a meta-analysis. A meta-analysis um, wouldn't have been helped because the study quality was low. So the outcome from this was that ACT isn't an empirically supported or established. There's promising evidence, and that's important to say, but it isn't an intervention we can be hugely confident in in this area. Looking at the quality assessment of the studies included in the systematic review, um, this table, I know it's, it's, it's a busy table, um, but what it shows is along the top, you've got the different trials that are randomized control trials and pre-post design. And then along the side, you've got different aspects that would indicate study quality. Um, two is higher quality. So the, the, the scale goes from two to zero. A two is higher quality, a zero is, is, is lower quality. There are some patterns in, in the data and I wanna just point out a few. So one is that across trials, there wasn't really an assessment of fidelity and fidelity assessments are really important because what they do is within an RCT, you train therapists to deliver the intervention and they may have a treatment manual to work to, but you don't know that what they actually do in the trial is in line with how you've trained them. So in randomized control trials, what often happens is the therapist will be recorded as they deliver intervention. And then afterwards, those recordings will go to external assessors who will use a standardized measure of fidelity to whatever treatment model, be that CBT, be that ACT or psychodynamic. Um, and they'll assess the extent to which the intervention was delivered as intended. And what we see across trials of ACT is that that really hasn't been done that often. Here's the criteria for a zero and a two. Okay, the other thing to notice here is that there were very few start with control conditions as well. So it was rare to use control groups and it was rare to use very um, high quality control groups. Those are just two things to pick up on this. So from this systematic review, it really, it was exciting in a way, in, in one way it was, it was slightly disappointing because I had hoped that the evidence base would be stronger, but it was exciting because what it showed is that there are a number of unanswered questions. And really since that systematic review, I've been focused on those unanswered questions and, um, and in developing studies to begin to answer them. These are the unanswered questions I see. One, does ACT work? Does it improve quality of life and mood in long-term conditions? Two, does ACT work how it's supposed to work? I've spoken about psychological flexibility. It should work via a change in that process. And three, so one of the things I didn't mention from the systematic review is that ACT has really been used to improve disease self-management or illness or long-term condition self-management. So um, it's rarely been used um, to help people um, make decisions around medication and help them adhere to their treatments. So I was interested in that as well. Okay, so coming to each of these questions in turn. Does ACT work? So what we need to this question is adequately designed and controlled trials. There are a number of new trials that have emerged since my systematic review. My systematic review was back in 2016. And this is one of the higher quality studies in long-term conditions. You can see that it's, it's a big, quite big randomized controlled trial of 168 parents of children with asthma. You can see that there was, a, in terms of the trial, there was a, an act plus um, education was compared to a really good control group, which was the education plus some follow-up um, telephone calls, which control for like attention and potentially expectancy. And there was one maybe drawback in this study, and that was that I think there was only one trial therapist. And what that means is you can't disentangle the effect of the intervention act from the person who delivered it. You've got a therapist condition confined. So we don't know if it was a really good therapist or it was ACT that led to the improvements. But what we do see here is, is some improvement key outcomes alongside a decrease in psychological inflexibility or our, our, our process variable. 
So that's good. That's an encouraging higher quality study. Not perfect, but higher quality. Another recent study is, is ACT um, for advanced cancer, the CAN-ACT trial. And I think ACT does seem to fit quite well in um, the context of advanced cancer. So I was really pleased to see this trial come on. And now this was a trial. It's a feasibility study, so it's not focused on questions around efficacy. And what you can see is, is 42 people were recruited and randomized to two groups. This trial is notable because it has one of the best control conditions that I've seen around in psychological therapies. It has a talking control that controls for things like um, sort of common therapeutic factors like therapist attention and expectancy. Now, slightly discouragingly in this trial, what we find is that the talking control had a better outcome after three months than ACT. So that, that's really pointed. Um, but interestingly then, and encouragingly again, by six months, the outcome was in favour of ACT. So turning to my own work um, in trials with ACT in long-term conditions, there's two that I, I, I'm involved with or have been involved with over the last little bit that I'd like to talk about. There's one that's ongoing, which is a multi-centre randomised control trial of ACT for motor neuron disease. And that's been led by Becky Gould um, down in UCL alongside um, colleagues at the University of Sheffield. And I think there might be a trial centre potentially in Liverpool as well. Um, but that's ongoing. The ACT mistrial is a randomised, was a randomised control trial of ACT for improving quality of life in muscular dystrophy. And that has just finished. So I'm going to talk about the results from that trial. Okay, so my PhD finished with developing an intervention uh, for people with muscle disorders um, that would fit the context so that they liked, that was acceptable to them, um, and that seemed to have, um, that, that we there was some signal might be helpful as well in terms of mood, quality of life and functioning. So we did a wee case series at the end of my PhD um, and we developed from that this intervention. So it's a guided self-help intervention. It's brief. It's four modules that are booklets that look like this, that come alongside audio files as well that contain things like mindfulness exercises and self-reflection exercises. And each of the modules, they, well, the four modules were delivered over five weeks. So there was a module one week, then the next week, then a break week, then the next week, then the next week. And we had a clinical psychologist who followed up um, with four telephone calls each module. And what the clinical psychologist did is they really tried to reinforce um, the use of some of the methods within the book and help the person reflect on how things were going. So they really tried to reinforce psychologically flexible behaviors. So the research question was, does this ACT intervention improve quality of life and mood better than standard medical care? So we aim to recruit 154 people with things like facioscapular muscular dystrophy, limb girdle muscular dystrophy, Becker muscular dystrophy, inclusion body myositis. Crucially, we wanted to get people who were experiencing some mild to moderate, well, mild and above distress. And this was based on the earlier case series that I'd done because what I found is that I sort of recruited everybody to my earlier case study, whether they had low quality of life and distress or none, under the expectation or the hope that it might help everybody improve their quality of life and mood, even if it's really good. And that's not what I found. So I find in my case series that there were many people that were already coping so well with muscular dystrophy and living life um, really in line with their values. Um, and the intervention didn't really seem to help those people much. They were already doing all the right things. We wanted people with a mild to moderate distress. We recruited from NHS clinics, from charities, from patient registries, and we randomised half to ACT, half to standard medical care, and we measured with questionnaires, quality of life, mood, symptom interference, and psychological flexibility at three weeks, so the middle of the intervention, six weeks right at the end, nine weeks, um, a little bit further out and six months as a follow-up. 
So we can see that there are promising trials coming out of ACH and we should be able to answer questions around efficacy quite soon. The second unanswered question is, does ACT work how it's supposed to act? Or, sorry, work how it's supposed to work in long-term conditions? Um, and to answer this question, we need better measures of ACT processes and we also need better measures of therapist behaviours or treatment fidelity. So focusing in on the first one, measures of ACT processes. This is a really key part of the research agenda for ACT, and that is understanding how ACT works. And if we can understand how ACT works and which aspects of ecological fle flexibility carry the effects of the intervention, then we might know which aspects to target within our treatment. To this end, there's loads of measures out there, self-report measures of psychological flexibility. So there's the acceptance and action questionnaire that I described earlier in the ACT trial and many others. So what I described in the earlier trial is that there, there can be a problem within uh, measurement in these questionnaires. What I see in clinic, if I do the AQ2, that's this questionnaire, and what we saw in the ACTMIS trial, is that when you give people the questionnaire in the first instance, and then you follow it up later, you might see an improvement in everything, but psychological flexibility gets worse, even though you're doing ACT, um, and even though their life has gotten better. So the question is, why is that? There's a few possibilities. One is that you're not doing ACT. Two is that ACT doesn't work via psychological flexibility. Both of these are possible. The third one is that there's a problem with the questionnaires. Occam's razor, and because I suppose I want to believe this, I've gone with this problem with the questionnaires as, as, a, as, a, as a first um, potential issue here. Now, if you look at the actual items, you can think about why this might be. This is all the items of the AAQ2 on the screen. Now, what I would say is that although these items make sense to us as therapists in that they've got really good face validity for measuring psychological flexibility, if you imagine you're not a psychologist and you don't routinely think about measuring this is not the most accessible um, measure. And what I think happens in therapy is that people get socialized to the ACT model and then realize that actually, I do worry about to control my feelings. I am afraid of my feelings. As they understand the model, they answer differently. So it's not about the intervention, it's about to understand a questionnaire that's inaccessible to begin with. So to understand whether this was the case, uh, we just finished a study and this study was run by Dr. Holly Castle. Um, and what she did was a cognitive interviewing study with this questionnaire, the AAQ2. The search question was, um, although the questionnaire has got face validity for therapists, what basis do clients answer these questions? And is this as the model or the questionnaire expect? So we uh, recruited 20 people from NHS chronic pain services and we did cognitive interviewing with them. So we had them re so basically cognitive interviewing and the think aloud technique involves verbalizing your thought processes as you do something. In this case, it's about verbalizing your thought processes as you do the questionnaire. So you were speaking of why you're giving that a four and not a two. We recorded this and transcribed it verbatim. And then following that, we went through the transcripts and we looked for errors in answers. And specifically, there were a number of different types of errors. I'm not going to go into these in too much detail, but there was a lexical error, which was just not understanding one word. There was a logical error, which was about not holding together all parts of the question. So focusing in on one part, but not another. And then there was a conceptually inconsistent error, which was about answering the question actually in the opposite was intended um, by, by, the, by the questionnaire. And if you look at those items there, which do you think, so we did notice lots of problems with this questionnaire, which do you think were the most problematic items? I'll give you a second just to self-reflect on that. There's two in particular that were problematic. All right, so question three was one of the problematic ones. And what we saw here was many conceptually inconsistent errors. There were many errors in general, but just focusing in on conceptually inconsistent. And um, 25% of people, five out of 20, um, had, had difficulties here and answered in a way that was different to how the question was intended. 
Okay, so the next item where we saw lots of errors was item five. Interestingly here, there were lots of, there were, there were many lexical errors, given that there's so few words here, it's surprising that one of the words was problematic, but not surprising when you look at the quotes. So people really struggled with the term emotions. What does that mean? And that makes sense. Um, I think you can see really within the first quote here that the person really struggled with it. Okay, so moving forward, so this is the problem that we have is that lots of these measures I think are inaccessible and esoteric. Um, I just want to say that there's an ironic limitation our study as well. So low assessing the psychometric properties of this measure, we find that our assessment method had psychometric issues as well in terms of reliability. So we had two people doing the assessment of errors. And what we find is that the moderate agreement as to whether or not an error was present, and there was quite poor agreement as to whether and as, as to which type of error was present. So again, that's quite a humbling, um, <laughs> uh, humbling little outcome that, that knocks you um, firmly off your high hopes. Um, okay, so there are, there are problems with ACT measures in terms of accessibility, but what we see is that people are starting to develop ACT measures that are more um, intuitive. This is a group from Nottingham with Nima McAdam, David Dawson, and they've developed a measure called the Compact, which I think has, has, has more accessibility. Okay, moving on, second unanswered question is, um, well, it's the same unanswered question, but we need better measures of therapist behaviors and treatment fidelity. So what we notice is that ACT trials tend to emit measures of ACT fidelity. I spoke about this earlier on. We wondered if this was to do with the time and effort required to undertake this type of analysis. So as a group, and this was work led by Lucy O'Neill and also with Lance McCracken, we decided that it was useful to develop a concise and parsimonious measure of act that might work across different treatment contexts. And you can see the work is published there if you're interested. To do this, we did a Delphi study, which is basically where you get a group of experts together um, and you set them a task. Um, and the task here for this group of experts was to agree on a small number of act indicative and observable therapist behaviours and then work together to refine this down. Um, a Delphi study is, is an iterative process where a group, an expert group, works towards consensus. There's a few necessary features which the, the group don't know in the group. That there's feedback um, of all the group's feedback between the whole group and that there's an improvement over time. So the sample we recruited, we recruited from lots of different uh, places, but the sample we got um, were really highly expert. So you can see within this graph that, um, or this table, sorry, lots of them were peer reviewed actors, which is the highest level of training and act practice you can have. Um, and we had people from a range of different countries. Um, yeah, so we got, we got a suitably expert sample we did is to begin this work we had a prototype act fm with 42 items organized into defects of um, psychological flexibility and we had various different rounds so it looked like this a prototype act fm went in we had the delphi panel assess the items and suggest new ones then it came back to the research team who refined got refined it got rid of the unhelpful or lowly rated uh, questions and added in the new ones and then it happened again and then it happened again and what we got at the end was a final act fm that had 25 or 13 items depending on what you need the questions that we asked the panel within these rounds were for every item was it indicative was it observable and did they think it should be included in the final moment This is one of the findings from um, the second stage. And you can see the items that are shaded in gray are the items that made it through to the final questionnaire. The ones that are in white were the ones that didn't. Um, so you can get an example of what reached consensus and what didn't. You can see that the third one wasn't included and that's because it means that we were narrowly focused on one sub process of psychological flexibility, excluding another. So we needed reasonable coverage of all areas. Okay, so the ACT FM is completed. It's available, it's freely available. If you want it, you can email me or you can Google it. 
And what it ended up with was a one page of instructions and then 25 or 13 items to rate act fidelity. Finally, and very quickly, um, because I know I should be finishing, um, a last bit of work that I've been involved with recently is about thinking can ACT apply to the problem of treatment non-adherence? And to do this, we need to look, uh, we need to understand if cycle fle flexibility correlates with or predicts disease self-management. And then we need to understand within trials, if we manipulate psychological flexibility, do we get an improvement in self-management or treatment adherence? ACT might be applicable to um, non-adherence because if you think about it, taking medication, so I'm, I'm gonna speak about this later, so I'll, I'll use this example. One example is, is hormone therapies after breast cancer. Um, hormone therapies are helpful in reducing the risk occurrence of breast cancer, but they also bring side effects like pain and fatigue, and then also um, men menopausal symptoms as well. Um, what this means, we think, is that if you're going to take your medication, then you have to be willing to open up to some of these difficult side effects. And all taking the medication might remind you of the illness that you've had and the fact that the illness could come back. And also, if you think about young women taking the, this medication, it might put you in contact with um, some difficult stories about yourself as well. So we wonder if you can improve psychological flexibility, you might get an improvement um, in outcomes in breast cancer. The first study that really set this up um, was this, this study by Moitra, um, and, and they really advanced the psychological flexibility model as, as an area for it. So we've done a few studies looking at whether or not psychological flexibility predicts non-adherence. These studies were led by uh, Dr. Anthony Harrison in Leeds and Dr. Caroline Fernandez in Teesside. What we found within COPD, um, COPD, um, there's a treatment for COPD called pulmonary rehab, and it is quite effective, but the problem is people don't tend to go to pulmonary rehab. So we wanted to see if psychological flexibility would predict that. What we found is that it did predict it. It was a small amount of the variance, but it was predictive. Another study with HIV, this was an online questionnaire study, and slightly less encouragingly, we find really small correlations between psychological flexibility and adherence. And then when we um, controlled for demographic and disease factors, what we find is that psychological flexibility was no longer predictive. So psychological flexibility may be important, but it's only one factor in explaining non-adherence is what the evidence is beginning to suggest. We're doing a trial at the minute of, of ACT for breast cancer, a small trial. I'm not going to talk about that in detail, but if you are interested, I'm happy to talk about it later. Okay. So just coming through to our conclusions, so theoretically, ACT fits the context of long-term conditions, and we see that it does make sense, and we see that within the uptake among clinicians in our services. Yet the results from trials, randomized controlled trials, are consistently encouraging, but the trial quality is low. And so what that means is the empirical status of ACT for long-term conditions is unclear. In order to answer key questions of efficacy and process, many groups, including some that I'm working with, are working on quality powered and controlled trials involving improved measures of ACT specific processes and treatment fidelity. Okay, that's me. Thank you very much. Oh, that's my thank you slide. These are all the people that have worked on the studies mentioned here. A big thank you to all of them. And you can see specifically Liverpool's very own Charlotte Crahe within there as well. Thank you very much, Chris, and uh, lovely to see the Lanyon building in Belfast and Queen's Uni. Thanks, Chris. Uh, a really comprehensive presentation uh, encompassing uh, your interest in acceptance and commitment therapy from a clinical perspective and, of course, the extensive body of research that you've been developing that's touched on clinical trials, so evaluating interventions for chronic health problems, but also looking at the science that sits behind ACT and the measurement of change of ACT. So fascinating to look at the work around the acceptance and action questionnaire as a measure of psychological flexibility and to critique that. And um, the cognitive interviewing study that you did, uh, really eliciting some feedback from people who complete the measure and identifying some of those inconsistencies and how it's interpreted and how people respond to it. But uh, wonderful as well to um, see you present about the ACT-FM 
which is a great acronym as well as a, a fantastic fidelity measure. And uh, that's so important in terms of assuring quality in the work that people do, both in research settings around ACT, but also in the supervision of people's clinical activity. And I know that that's going to receive extensive use as it has been doing, but moving forward, that's going to be a really useful tool. So um, yeah, thank you for, for, for talking today. And um, it's also important to emphasize that um, some of the studies that you were presenting, I know have been uh, done with the involvement of trainee clinical psychologists uh, yeah. at the University of Edinburgh, isn't that right? Um, so yeah, um, I think some of them were, were my trainee projects, um, but then I think some of the better studies were done recently by my trainees in Leeds. So now Dr. Holly Castle, now Dr. Lucy O'Neill led on those uh, studies, the Cognitive Interviewing Study and the ACT-FM. Um, so yes, um, trainee projects and, and trainee research is just, in my experience, it's some of the high quality studies I've been involved with have come from that, um, and some of the most interesting studies as well. So yeah. Thank you. Uh, maybe if I could just uh, pose a, a bit of a question, and to an extent you were, you were getting to this at the, the end of um, your, your presentation, um, but just by way of the body of work that you've been doing, uh, where do you see your research activity moving in the next um, couple of years? Are there particular areas of interest that perhaps you haven't had as much time to elaborate on today that you would like to highlight? Or are there aspects of what you've been just speaking about, particularly in the latter part of your presentation, that you'd like to elaborate a bit more on? Well, there, there is one uh, that I think is really interesting. I don't know what I'm going to do with it, but um, if if you think about all these randomised trials, you think about what we do as a job, Ross, in terms of training people, that's an intervention. Training somebody to deliver ACT is an intervention. Um, training somebody to deliver CBT or psychodynamic therapies as well. And the intervention bit is, is our training package, how we do it. Um, and that is so rarely assessed. So as I'm really interested in the idea, does ACT training result in an improvement um, or, or, or more fidelity to the ACT model? And which aspects of that training are important? And I think the same could be true of CBT, the same could be true of psychodynamic therapies. But within every trial, there's this where you train your therapists. And that is the first intervention. Nobody seems to ask these questions. They take it for granted, I think, that ACT training leads to improvements in ACT their practice. And we don't really know that. So I think that's fascinating, as, and, and as somebody that works on a clinical program as well, um, I think that's fascinating because what we do is we train people to deliver therapies, but is it effective? Yeah, you're think... you're going to find this, I mean, I don't want to pull on that string and, and the world falls apart, but I think it's just <laughs> an interesting question for the, for the future. Um, yeah, I think that's a, a really important point. And, um, you know, these processes of change, which are purported to be important in different types of therapy. So if we take acceptance and commitment therapy, and uh, we know that psychological flexibility is purported to be an important aspect of therapeutic change. Uh, when we train people, when people do get the opportunity to learn about these interventions and to prepare themselves to work with clients using them, do you get changes in psychological flexibility? in terms of the, the work that they are doing to learn more about the approach. And certainly in the work that we did in Sierra Leone to train non-specialists uh, in using acceptance and commitment therapy over the course of um, three workshops, you did evidence change that was sustained at three months in terms of their own psychological flexibility. Um, but yeah, it would be fascinating to see, well, to what extent does the training that people receive actually equate to um, them becoming more expert and going out and embodying uh, the change processes that they have been learning about? Really fascinating, Ross, yeah. Okay, any other questions? I've got one, Ross. Great, go ahead, please. Hi, Chris. Um, hey, really good to hear you talk. Um, I was quickly taking notes when you were talking about psychological flexibility. So um, I was just wondering, um, it's, it's probably quite a broad question, but how many kind of sessions would you be working with somebody to try and change psychological flexibility? And would you work, so say, with a group of people 
you were looking at taking hormone therapies after cancer would you work long term in that model or is it uh, seen as a more kind of short term intervention really good question i could i could talk all day on on, on that uh, on that answer but i'll spare you all and i'll, I'll cut to the chase um so you can deliver act in lots of different ways so there is a really brief version of act called fact fast act um, that you can use to really to really cut to the chase with your intervention um, act is like all other psychological therapies in some way and, and in that i think having a good therapeutic relationship um, focusing really on the person you're working with and giving them time and space is probably going to be more helpful for long-term change mm -hmm. but in some contexts you do have less time with somebody it could be to do with the service you're working in um, or it could be about the type of intervention you're delivering as well so moving on to the um, action trial which is the trial of act uh, for non-adherence um, in breast cancer that's a really brief intervention um, so we three uh, groups with one face-to-face uh, -face session with a clinical psychologist and that's because we wanted to see if it would help um, a wide group of people and have a small impact on a wide group of people as opposed to a large in impact on fewer people so i suppose to come back to a summary of the answer it would be that i think time and space and more sessions and mm -hmm. um, with a good therapeutic yeah. relationship is going to give you more of an impact on psychological flexibility but you can distill it down to brief versions um, mm. And they do seem to be reasonably effective as well. I don't know if that answers your question. No, no, it absolutely does. Yeah. Um, I was just, I think when I was hearing you, I was thinking, oh, this could work really well quite quickly, potentially. But then, obviously, with lots of our clients, it, you know, it can be a mind, it, there can be a shift, can't it? But it does take time to kind of embed that into how you relate to things differently over a long term period. So, yeah, it's really helpful. Thank you. Sorry. I work mainly in dementia services, so doing RCTs in dementia, and just the fact that some of these abilities and things are going to change over time anyway. Yeah. So how you kind of control for that, and I'm imagining that with some of the kind of neurodegenerative diseases, like how you actually control within that, because you're not expecting necessarily some kind of improvement. And it made me think when you were talking about the disability scales, really, um, you wouldn't necessarily expect someone to improve on them, but actually, even if you see them staying kind of steady that's a massive improvement isn't it in some ways so, so if, you've got, yeah. if you've got the control group you might expect yeah. one control group to decline more than another for example mm. so, um, I know that doesn't feel like a very positive outcome so the control group might decline more so than the intervention group or the intervention yeah. group might say constant whereas the control group declines so yeah it's really the control becomes crucial and if you think there are certain variables that are going to dictate that decline then you might want to stratify in your randomization to make sure that you've got equal numbers of people in the two groups that that might have that characteristic that would dictate the decline if that makes sense absolutely um, thanks chris it's a wee challenge Thank you. So. absolutely <laughs> I think time has beaten us, but I know that uh, you would be open, Chris, to folk who maybe have had questions that you haven't had an opportunity to respond to. Uh, you'd be okay with them dropping you an email? Absolutely, yeah, that'd be great. Actually, I'd really enjoy that. Please do. Uh, yeah. Great. Well, on behalf of the, the programme team and the wider Declan Liverpool community, just want to thank you for a really tremendous keynote. And it's lovely to read the appreciation that some people have made on the, the chat, but uh, is shared more broadly, I imagine, between uh, all of us that are on the conference today. So uh, we hope that you might be able to drop in to some of the sessions. You're very welcome to do that. Um, appreciate you're, you're busy and that you've got lots of commitments, but I uh, want to wish you well in the work that uh, you're going to be doing moving forward. Um, it's really important work and clearly as the questions we're tapping into and as you alluded to in the presentation, um, this is uh, really critical to supporting people through a very difficult phase in their life and supporting the families of those affected by uh, chronic illness as well. So thanks again, Chris. Oh, thank you so much, Ross, and, and thank you everybody that's tuned in, um, and particularly to people that are new to the Liverpool course as well. Welcome uh, to the start of your career. <laughs>